that will run down to the sea Like my heart longs for an ocean To wash down
every voice. I am a child of God. You are the leader. And I'm no Let me just real quick tell you, it is an honor to lead in Christ Fellowship. Uh, it is not lost on me. I, I pinch myself often to say, man, am I seriously getting to lead this amazing body of people? Um, today is a special day. So one person asked me if I wore a jacket because I was in mourning uh, going to a funeral for the Buckeyes playoff chances. Um, no, today is a special day, uh, a day where we're going to publicly, the, the board and the church and some of my good friends are coming together saying, man, we believe that God has called this man to lead this church for this season. Uh, let me just real quick uh, introduce you to two uh, couples that are dear to me that have made their way here. Uh, the first is uh, Pastor Tom and his lovely bride, Nona. Can you guys can stand up? We just want to give you guys a round of applause. Tom and Nona, by way of Houston, Texas. Uh, Tom has been a dear friend and a mentor um, since we moved to Houston, and he was the man that first told me, uh, I believe God's plan for you, Derek, is to be a pastor, and, uh, and he transitioned with me and walked me through many decisions and prayerful moments of leaving the corporate world and stepping into uh, the role of a pastor. And so, uh, Tom, I know I'm forever indebted to you. I love you guys. So glad that you got to be here today. Uh, and then the other couple uh, who I'm really excited to be here uh, was my pastor from Ohio, uh, the man who baptized me and the man who first asked me to preach a sermon. Uh, is here today. His wife, uh, Mary and Matthew are here. Uh, such an honor. I love his teaching. Uh, Matthew taught me so much about God. The first man to really introduce me to real teaching about the Holy Spirit. Uh, he taught me to love the Word of God, and he gave me an opportunity to express the gifts that God has given me. And for that, I'm just so grateful. And so I'm so excited for our church to hear him preach today, because whenever he preaches, it's powerful. So let's put our hands together big time and welcome Pastor Matthew. So good to have you. Love you. Get your mic on this time. I do. <laughs> the first service, I came out here without my mic on. It was the one thing Derek asked me to do, and I forgot to do it. So this service is already better. But I just want to say what an honor it is for me to be here. Uh, you don't have to be in a place very long before you can sense a culture. And you have a culture of honor, a culture of love and generosity. And I'm just, Mary and I have been blown away by it, from your staff to the volunteers to just the members of the church. So I just want to say thank you. It's an honor to be here. And I absolutely love your pastor and his wife, Kate. Um, I, I love them so much that for years I have tried to recruit them to come back on our staff full time. Uh, so here's my promise to you. I'll stop trying to recruit them. And, uh, but I'm excited to hear. And I can prove my love for Derek in this statement, I was raised in the wonderful state of Michigan. I am a diehard University of Michigan fan, and I still came to honor him and this crazy <laughs> Buckeye. Can we all thank God for Iowa, though? Can, amen on that one. Oh, it's mm, so good. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's funny that you know that. Mary and I noticed that Derek would say that years ago, but have you also noticed that he'll bite his lip when he says it? Mm, it's so good. So I'm just going to add to that. Uh, but it is so great to be here. And, uh, and I can't make any Buckeye jokes where I'm from. I pastor in Ohio, middle of Buckeye country. If I make jokes about the Buckeyes, people get up and leave. <laughs> so uh, it's good to be here. I might make a few more as the service goes on. You okay with that? So here's what I want to do. I, I've been given the honor to talk to you today on a special day, a day where you are installing Pastor Derek as your lead pastor. And so I want to give a message that I think every church needs to hear in order to have a healthy church. I've been a pastor for 18 years, and these are the principles that I've learned and the principles that I teach my church. And so if you have a Bible, do me a favor and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to be there in about 10 minutes. I'm just giving you a head start. And, uh, and here's what I'm doing is I, I want to talk today about our calling. Every single one of us has a calling in our lives. It's a calling that has been established by God. 
And what we need to understand is the weight of this. God has designed us and placed us in our lives to accomplish something that, that he has commanded us to do. And this is what determines the success for our lives. Our culture will tell us that there's so many ways to define success, from the amount of money we have to the amount of authority or power that we have to the types of relationships. But the truth is, is all of those things can be a form of success, but the only thing that really matters is if we fulfill the calling that God has placed on our lives. And so today I wanna to talk about that. And, and to understand our calling, we need to understand that there's actually two parts to it. The first part is that we are called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And when we hear that, the, the phrase disciple is not one that we commonly use in our culture anymore. But a disciple, a simple definition is a person who makes it the commitment of their lives to try to mimic another person or a set of beliefs. And Jesus has called every single one of us to become a disciple of him, to live our lives in a way that mimic the type of life that he lived here on earth. And I want you to think about that for a moment. Jesus, without question, is the most generous and patient and full of grace person who has ever walked this earth. And, and he has called each one of us to follow him and to live a life that he lived, to be generous as he is generous and kind and thoughtful and, and even holy, to live a life that he modeled for us. And when Jesus was asked about this, he didn't do a bait and switch. He didn't say following me would be super easy. It would be like rainbows and clouds. It would be just, everyone can float on it. It won't be that big of a deal. Instead, Jesus used very vivid language to describe what it would actually be like to be a disciple of his. Here's what he said in Matthew 16. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. The image that Jesus chose to use to teach us principle is the image of the cross. And the truth is, for us as Christians, or those that have been familiar with the, the Christian beliefs, we have in some way romanticized the cross because of the powerful work of Jesus. And I'm not saying that's a negative. But for us, when we look at images of the cross or we think about it, to us it invokes a positive image because of what Jesus has done for us. But when Jesus spoke these words, it was before his crucifixion. There would have been no positive imagery of the cross. Instead, his audience would have understood that this was the most violent form of execution that had been ever created to that point. And the Roman Empire would use it to execute any type of criminal. So when Jesus was saying, you know what's going to be like in order to follow me, when he said it's going to be like taking up your cross, it meant something completely different to them. He was saying, you have to be willing to die to yourself and your wants and your desires, the goals that you set for your life. You have to be willing to surrender those every single day of your life in order to follow me. And the imagery he used was one of excruciating and painful one. He, he said, you're going to have to die every single day. And the truth is, is when we hear the idea that we have to surrender our rights and our desires to follow someone, there is something painful that arises in our hearts. And here's the truth. None of us like anyone telling us what to do. Is that right? Okay, then you're much holier than I am because I know I don't like it when people tell me what to do. I still wrestle with that. And I'm a father of four and all four of my kids hate to be told what to do. Can you remember when you were a kid and you were thinking, I can't wait till I'm an adult so I can do whatever I want to do. How many of you remember that? Because we don't like the idea of surrendering ourselves. And Jesus says, if you follow me, you have to be willing to die to yourself so that I can determine what you're going to do in your life. But that's just the first part of the calling. The second part is we are called to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus calls us to do the very thing he's called us to do individually. He's called us to do corporately. As the Holy Spirit draws people into a relationship with the Father, he has called other Christians to come around them and walk them down this painful process of dying to themselves to live for Jesus. Here's what he said when he called them, Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We are called to walk people down this very difficult process. And just think about how that conversation goes. 
We, we go to them and we say, you know, you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And, and the Holy Spirit does his work in their hearts and they realize, yes, this is what they need to do. And, and oftentimes people are like, you know, what's it going to be like to be a Christian? And our response is, well, imagine someone takes a large metal stake and they jam it, jam it through your hands and your feet and they nail you to a cross. It's going to be something like that. Hey, you want to join my church? I mean, this is the imagery that this seemingly impossible task of us individually becoming disciples, then we have to take that task and help other people in that process. And when we look at it, the, the truth is, if we really feel the weight of it, it's an overwhelming task. It's a heavy task. And this is the task that determines if we are successful in our lives or not. Are we disciples? Are we making disciples? And when we look at this, we can easily be overwhelmed. But here's the good news. God gave us specific tools that we need to utilize in order to be successful. And the truth is, is the two tools I'm going to talk about today, if we don't use either one of them, there is no chance that we can truly be successful. And so here's the first tool that God has given us. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. God is with us. Isn't that good news? God, who created all and came to the earth to redeem us, is the same God who says, I want to place my spirit inside each one of you to empower you, to change your life. Here's what Jesus said in the Last Supper. Many of you are familiar with this story. But in the Last Supper, leading up to it, for the many months leading up to it, we see in the Gospels that Jesus over and over kept telling his disciples, I'm going to go away. I'm going to leave and, and, and they were just, they always thought he was talking figuratively, so they never really felt the weight of it. But then at the Last Supper, he says, no, guys, really, I'm leaving. Like, this is it. And they became distraught. They were heartbroken. They were stressed. And, and he's comforted them. And these are the words he used to comfort them. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. And this word another in the Greek is the idea of one that is different but the same. And so he's saying, like, not only, like, so I'm physically here, but I'm going to leave, but God's going to send God back to you. And then he explains how it's going to process. To be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. This is one of my absolute favorite verses in the Bible. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. God says, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm not leaving you as an orphan. I'm going to make my home inside of you. And this is incredible to think about. All the promises that Jesus gave us concerning the Holy Spirit. He, he told us that the Holy Spirit would comfort us, that he would convict us of sin, of righteousness, and a judgment to come, that he would teach us new things, that he would guide us into all truths, that he would remind us of the teachings of Jesus. He, he told us that he would empower us, that he would produce fruit in our lives so he would change us from the inside out so that we would be more loving, more patient, more, more self-control, all the fruit of the Spirit. Why? Because that's how is the best way to live. But he also told us that he would give us supernatural gifts to accomplish this incredible calling. So on one side, this incredible tool that God gave us is himself. God is with us. But do you know, and, and I don't mean this, as, when I say this, this will sound like kind of bad theology, but do you know that wasn't the only tool that God gave us? He gave us another one that he knew we would desperately need in order to be successful. And I'm not saying that God lacks anything and God has lack of any power, but in the perfect plan that God had for us, he said one tool would be God with us, but here's the second one, that we would be empowered by the body of Christ. We have each other. And the body of Christ is language that we'll look at in just a moment that's referring to the church. So he says, here's my perfect plan for the world. I will be with you and you will have each other. Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians 12. This is where I asked you to turn. He said, for just as the body is one, so he's talking about the physical body now, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Later on in verse 27, he will say this, and he's writing to the church in Corinth, which is modern day Greece. He said, now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. What, what he's talking about is that when we are saved, every single one of us become the physical body of Jesus. And what I mean by that, when, when Jesus was here, he told his disciples, he says, I'm physically leaving. And 2,000 years ago, he did exactly that. He ascended into heaven physically. But he said, you are now going to be my hands and feet to the world. 
You're going to be my physical representation. And understand this. This is God's perfect plan. There is no plan B. His perfect plan is that his men and women would continue to pursue him in discipleship and continue to make other disciples, and they would spread the good news of the gospel to the entire world. And now 2,000 years later, think about this, it began with 11 men, and 2,000 years later, billions of people all around the world have heard this message of Jesus because they walked through this process. They knew God was with them and that they had each other. And so as the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Corinthians, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he goes on and explains what this actually means to be the body of Christ. In verse 14, he says, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So he's using this imagery of the physical body, comparing it to the church. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Now, what did Paul just say? I mean, it's super blunt, super convicting. Paul said, you know, the truth is, is that in the church, there are times that we will make excuses for why we're not doing our part. We're not doing what God has called us to do. And Paul's, his viewpoint of this is just because we make an excuse does not remove the responsibility that we have to be the body of Christ. Now, that's a lot of heavy weight, isn't it? That Paul is saying, I, I get it. We make excuses. We can make excuses for this season and that season, and we can have valid reasons. But he's saying, understand this. You still have a calling that is not removed from you because you make an excuse. And the calling is to be the body of Christ, to do your part. And he goes on and says, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, and get this, I love this, how the image he uses, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. It's interesting. It doesn't say, and God took a vote. It doesn't say that God had a conversation with us and asked us where we wanted to go and where we wanted to be. What it says is that God knew exactly what was needed in order to make the body of Christ healthy, and he knew exactly what was needed for us in our lives, and so God placed us. And what that means is it's not about our preferences. It's not about our goals. It's not about our desires. And it's hard to hear that. And this is why Jesus clearly said, I want to be clear, if you want to follow me, it's going to require you to die to yourself because we're surrendering all that we want to accomplish and saying, God, I trust you. I trust that you know what's best for me. I trust that you know what's best for the church. And here's what it goes, uh, a point that I want you to understand is God arranges the body with you in mind. I mean, think about this. I, I don't know you yet, but I can make an assumption. As I look around this room, this room is, is so diverse, D diverse in talents and abilities and desires. And God, when he was thinking about your church, he knew that this church, Christ Fellowship, needed you. On this special day, do you know that God knew that your church needed Pastor Derek? And it's crazy to think about. All these years ago, when Derek first came to my church, I had no idea the plans that God had for him. You want to know the truth? This is the honest truth. The first time Derek and Kate walked in, they walked by us, and I was standing next to one of my friends. You know my first thought about Derek? I bet he'd be really good on the church softball team. That's the depth of my spirituality in that season is I, I looked at this athletic looking guy and I thought, I bet he could help us. And, and then Derek and I started to connect and we started to become friends and we started to just have lunch together and talk more often. And, and here's a, a funny story. If you know my personality, you, you'll realize how this is not like me. One day I went up to Derek and if he tells a story, I didn't actually remember this. He just reminded me recently. He was coming out of the bathroom, what <laughs> an odd place to meet and have this discussion. But he's coming out of the bathroom and I was going in and I said, hey, I put you on the teaching schedule. And if you know me, I, I really fiercely protect the pulpit of where I'm the pastor. I don't just put anyone up there. But here's what I didn't know. I really believe that God must have blinded my mind. I didn't know that Derek had never taught before. Some reason in my mind I had it that he had taught many times. And, and so Derek came and he taught and did this incredible job. And months later, we were at a Mexican restaurant sitting down eating. And I said to him, so how long have you been teaching? And he almost sheepishly said, like, well, that was my first. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, like, oh, God, what have I done? You know, like, <laughs> I didn't even think this through. But you know who knew the perfect plan for his life? God. And God knew that that would launch Derek down a pathway of ministry that would lead him here to be your lead pastor. 
God knew what this church needed. God knew what you needed. And the truth about our bodies is a healthy body, a healthy church only happens when the members are healthy and operating the way they were designed and commanded to do. A healthy body is the most effective body. Uh, this past week, I was at a retreat with my staff. And, and while we were there, I reached into my bag and I was pulling out a hard drive and it just was, it was metal encased. And for whatever reason, it just sliced the tip of my finger, just like a, almost like a paper cut, but deeper. And it's amazing. The rest of my body was healthy. I had nothing else injured, nothing else sick. And yet just a little cut on the tip of my index finger was the most annoying thing. It actually changed how I was operating throughout the week. I had to keep my finger out because every time I used my hand, I would bump it and it would sting and it would cause it to bleed again. And, and so I had to keep my finger. I had to wash my hands like that. I had to pick up something like that. I looked like real proper, you know, like as I was doing stuff. And it was just this little cut and it was so annoying. But you know what? That's a perfect illustration of the body, the church. When we are all doing our part, we are our most effective form. Will the church still be successful if people don't do their part? Sure. Because God is sovereign and he does amazing things through our limit, limit, uh, limit. There's a word there that I want to use. I can't think of what it is. <laughs> Something where we don't have, we have limits. All right, you get what I'm trying to say, okay? <laughs> but when we are all operating in our giftings and in our talents and the way God has designed us to operate, that's when we are our most effective form. And so Paul goes on in verse 19, he says, With, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on the parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body. Remember that, because I'm going to come back to it at the end of the message. That there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And here's the truth that this is teaching. What's best for me is best for the body. What's best for the body is best for me. The truth is at this church, this church will be at its best when you are at your best. And, and this, sometimes when a pastor gets up and they teach, and some of the topics they have to teach on seem self-serving to the church. So, I mean, we know this. At some point, Pastor Derek's going to have to get up and talk about money, and that will seem self-serving to the church, or he'll talk about volunteering and serving at the church, and it'll seem self-serving. And you know the truth is, on one level it is, but it's also a blessing to you. And here's what I mean by that. I want you to think for a moment of all the community groups that you're a part of. So one, it would be Christ Fellowship, but if you're part of a club or some organization and you're connecting with them, what's the best way to experience community? Is it to always take, 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 never to give? I think we all would agree, no, that's not the best way to experience community. It's very selfish. But if I were to flip that around and say, okay, so is the best way to experience community to give, 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 give? I think we're all smart enough to realize that's not the healthiest form of community either. Eventually that will burn us out if we only give and we never take. The absolute best way to experience community is to do both, to give and to take, to give and to take, to bless the church and allow the church to bless you, to bless your community, allow the community to bless you. And this is the truth that Paul is communicating in 1 Corinthians, that what's best for you is what's best for the church. When you are at your best, this church will thrive. And when this church is at its best, you will thrive in your life. But then the flip of that is also true. What's bad for me is bad for the body. And what's bad for the body is bad for me. When you are struggling and you are hurting, the church will suffer. And when the church is struggling, the church is hurting, you will suffer. And so what Paul is giving us is the weight of this truth. We are called to be the body of Christ, but with that comes incredible responsibility. And so here's what I wanna do in a really practical way. I wanna give you five quick things, five quick things that I've learned in my 18 years of being a pastor that are absolutely necessary to have a healthy church, a healthy body, and this is what will equip you to be successful and to live out the vision that God has placed in Pastor Derek's heart. Here's the first one. You must pursue God. You expect a pastor to say that, right? You expect a pastor to get up and say, you need to pursue God. But here's what I mean. I just want to put the weight out there on you. You have to pursue God in studying his word. You have to pursue God in prayer, in, in creating dialogue with God, talking and listening to him. You have to pursue God by seeking out his presence. And why? 
Because when you are seeking God, that is the healthiest version of you. You will see more clearly. You will love more deeply. You will forgive more easily. When you are seeking God, you will be at your absolute best. But I'll flip that around. When you are not seeking God, that will absolutely be the most selfish version of yourself. You will not love well. You will not forgive well. You will not serve well. You will have a distorted picture of life. And even though you think you're seeing clearly and you'll judge others, it's not God's ideal for you. But when you are pursuing God and in his presence, he will change you from the inside out and you will be the healthiest version of yourself, which means the church will thrive. Here's the second thing you need to do is you need to connect. And I mean that relationally. Here's a weird analogy, but I think we all can agree that it's more effective than simply carrying an arm would be an arm attached. You guys all get that? You like that visual there? Can you imagine just carrying an arm versus attached? When it's attached and connected, we all recognize that's the most effective form. And the same thing is true of the body of Christ. When you are connected relationally on many levels, that is what's necessary in order for the church to be healthy. Why? Because when you're connected relationally, you can care better. You can love more deeply. When I know what you're going through, I can love you better. That's why Pastor Derek and I stay in contact with each other, calling and texting each other. Why? Because when we know what's going on in each other's lives, we can love each other better. And not just care, but support, to come alongside Because there'll be seasons in our ministry where I have to lift Derek up and there'll be seasons in my ministry where he'll have to lift me up and give me that support. And the only way that happens is if we stay connected in relationship, but also connection allows us to have accountability. That together and doing life together, having a standard of honoring God, when we walk together in life, we raise the bar in each other's life. And this is why connection is so critical for the health of a church. Here's the third, is you have to serve. You have to find a place for you to serve. And I will say this, every single person who calls this church home, it is your responsibility to serve in some way. Now, there might be a season where you suffer loss, a season where you're struggling, and it's just not in you to serve. That's the responsibility of the church to come around you and to serve you. Just the same way if you were to break an arm, there's a season you put it in a cast and put it in a sling. But if you're not in one of those seasons, it's your responsibility to serve in some capacity. And I know as a pastor, every day throughout the week, there are people in our church serving. Some are cutting up papers for the children's ministry or putting together the crafts. Others are going in our sanctuary and stuffing the back of the seat uh, seat backs. I mean, there's so many jobs. Some are mowing the yard outside. I mean, there's so many things. So I would encourage you, if you're not serving in some capacity, connect with the staff and ask them, "What, what can I do to take something off your plate so that you can serve the church more? Here's the fourth. You need to give. And you need to give financially. You know, here's the truth. You know, it, it's so weird. People, whenever a pastor gets up and talks about money, people are like, oh, here they go again. <laughs> See, I can say whatever I want right now. I'm a guest speaker. So <laughs> it's, it's a cool privilege. And, you know, Pastor Derek can get up next to you and go, hey, I'm sorry about that, dude, you know. But, but I just want to tell you as a pastor, it, it takes money to do church. And, and when people put the pressure on the pastor not to talk about money, it's such an unhealthy thing. Because God has blessed us so that we can bless others. And God has blessed us so that we can bless the body of Christ with the finances that he's given us. So here's my challenge to you. Give to God first. Give your first fruits offering. Why? Because that is the portion that requires faith. To say to God, God, before I do anything else, I'm going to worship you with my money. I'm going to give to you first and believing that with the remainder that I have, you can do more with that than I ever could. And so give to God first, honor him with a tithe, the first 10%, and then go above and beyond in generosity. Why? Because out of Jesus' own mouth, he said this, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. See, we know that receiving is blessed. When someone gives you a gift, no one has to tell you that's a blessing. You're like, oh, thank you. I I love that. But Jesus goes, you know what's better than that? Is to give. Because when we give, not only do we experience a deeper happiness in our hearts than we can ever get from receiving, but also his supernatural favor is placed in our lives. And so let's be generous in our finances. Lastly, and this one carries a lot of weight. It's something I talk to my church about often. You have to fight against disunity. Do you know the truth is, is that the biggest threat to any church, so I'll say specifically to your church, but any church is not a threat from the outside. You know how I know that? Because no weapon formed against you can prosper. You know who said that? God said that. No weapon formed against this church can prosper. The biggest threat is from the inside of having disunity erupt inside a church and to rip it apart from the inside out. And this past week, I was having a staff retreat with my staff, and I had about 16 of us together. And I teach this so often to my church that at one point in my discussion, I said to the group, guys, what's the biggest threat to our church? And all 16 of them in unison said, disunity. Because I just pounded in their heads over and over. We have to fight for unity. 
We have to choose to love well. We have to choose to think the best about each other. We have to choose not to receive ever a gossip report against someone else in the church. And I mean that over your friends. I mean that over your leadership. If anyone comes to you and wants to spread a lie or say anything negative to disrupt the church, know this. It's not from God. And you know how I know that? Because in Proverbs chapter 6, God lists six things that he absolutely hates. That's his terminology. God hates. And here's the last one. God hates a false witness who breathes out lies and one who sows discord among brothers. In the same way in your body, if you find out you have an infection on the inside or cancer or sickness, you will with urgency attack it so that you can be healthy as a body. You have to do that as a church. And so here's my encouragement. If you do these five things, pursue God, connect to each other, serve, give, and fight against disunity, you will be the healthiest version of your church and you will accomplish incredible things in the name of God and you will see this community changed. And I know that's a desire of your heart. Can I pray for you? God, I love you. We love you. Thank you for the honor and the privilege we have of serving you, of being called the body of Christ. And Lord, I pray a special blessing upon this church and Pastor Derek and his wonderful wife, Kate. I pray that you will anoint them and bless them and help them to find favor in every single way. And God, we give you all the glory and pray this in your mighty name. Amen.